Welcome to the Bank Shot, a Knicks podcast on WFAN and Radio.com. Your host, John Schmilk. Welcome to another episode of the Bank Shot, my Knicks podcast on WFAN and Radio.com. My name is John Schmelk. want to remind you, you can also find this podcast on all your favorite podcast platforms. Make sure you subscribe, make us part of your feed, and if you like what you hear, add us to your favorites and leave a positive review if you're on Apple Podcast. Guys, uh, thanks for being with us again. The Knicks coming off a win, and to talk about it, we're joined by the guy who runs the show over at Knicks Fan TV, and that is CP. You can follow them on Twitter at Knicks Fan TV. Go to YouTube.com slash Knicks Fan TV. They do recaps after every game. They do call-ins. They do everything you could imagine. CP, what, what do you want to tell the fans about what you guys do over there? Uh, morning, John. Well, you know what? Knicks Fan TV, it's just a platform for the fans, by the fans, and just an opportunity for the fans to uh, express their opinions, express how they feel about the team. We do post-game live analysis after every game where we uh, have analysis, we show highlights of the game, and, and then we capture fan reactions through live phone calls. We also capture Twitter reactions as well. So it's a, it's a community of, of global Knicks fans who want to feel more connected to the team. And I think we do a great job of doing that. Yeah, you guys definitely do. I, I had the pleasure of being on the show in late summer. had a lot of fun. And if, for, for Knicks fans that are, that are looking for Knicks-specific content, it is a great thing to check out in the live streams after the games. Uh, is really fun as you guys are emotional after Knicks wins or losses. Unfortunately, it's been more losses than wins so far, CP. But it looks like the last few games, and even going back to the Chicago game where they blew it in the fourth quarter, they played well for three quarters in that game before Kobe White got hot. David Fisdale seems to be settling on a rotation and a lineup here, and for the most part, it seems to be working. Absolutely. I, I think that's one of the things that I, I was you know, certainly looking forward to seeing is you, you wanted to know when was this rotation going to be settled so that these guys can start to build chemistry. We saw the constant starting lineup changes, constant rotation changes, extending since last season, and I was really anxious to see when was this going to settle down. Uh, one of the key positions, obviously, uh, Damian Dotson. You know, Dotson had um, his signature Dotson-type game last night, and he's becoming a fixture as the backup, too. We're also seeing Bobby Cordes coming off the bench, which Fisdale actually said that's where he wants to keep him, and that was music to my ears because <laughs> I didn't see Cordes as a starter, and you're actually seeing a lot less of the Portis morris randall trio, which made uh, fans cringe a lot. So I think he's really settling on a, on a rotation, and, and they're starting to come together, um, hopefully at the right time, because the schedule gets no easier at this point. Yeah, and I think a big test is going to be your CP, is whether or not Fisdale sticks with this. Because we've seen before when things go bad, he has a tendency to his... his reaction seems to be, I'm going to switch things up and, and, and try to do things differently. But I really think it's important for him to stick with this for a while. And when it comes to Dotson, I never understood why it took Fisdale so long to go to him, given how well he played the final three months last year after he buried him the first two months last season. And, you know, he's a guy that can shoot and play defense, two things that are in short supply on this team. We've been a huge fan of Dotson since he came in, a prototypical 3 and D player. I mean, last night he just came out with so much zip, uh, facilitating as well. Defense, he was scrappy. I think what it was was, you know, with the shoulder surgery that he had, with Ellington being signed as, you know, one of, one of your free agent acquisitions, I, I figured that Ellington would have gotten the, the first shot at it given that, you know, he, he throws up three-pointers at about seven or eight attempts a clip. <laughs> and obviously, Fisdale wants to get that floor spacing out there with a, you know, high-efficiency score that Ellington can beat. Obviously, we've seen that Ellington hasn't. I mean, he's only shooting about 30% from three right now, so he hasn't gotten it going. We know that Alonzo Trier isn't the most uh, efficient offensive player um, out there. You know, he's constantly over-dribbling and, and things of that nature. So I think Dotson gives you that perfect balance offense and defense, and, and that's what Fisdale is looking for with the bench. And Julius Randle showed up. This was the guy that Nick fans and the Nick front office thought they were getting this offseason, a guy that was efficient on offense, only turned it over, I believe, once. He had four assists. He played his best game as a Nick. And, and I wonder what your take is. Is this simply a matter of him getting to play against C.D. Osman and just dominating him and against a better defense he's going to revert, or do you think he's starting to figure something out? 
I, I think he is starting to figure something out. You know, Julius has really taken this, um, you know, this role as the number one guy on the team. I think he's taken it very seriously. And I think as a result, he's put a lot of pressure on himself. You know, Fizdale also alluded to that why uh, the splits from home on the road were, were pretty different for a guy like Julius, even a guy like Frank. Um, Julius has really taken that, that leadership role um, to heart, and he, he wants to do well. You know, and we know that he can uh, do that. You know, every year since he's gotten in the league, he's, he's gotten better and better. I think last night what the difference was, yes, there was no Kevin Love or, or Larry Nance Jr. The competition was certainly uh, a bit lower. But I think you just saw a more patient Julius Randle, not over-dribbling, not dribbling into three guys. I think the best play of the night he made was he had uh, – he was on the elbow. I forgot who he was guarded by, and, and he had the guy in the triple threat stance, and he just swung it over to RJ quick across the court, and yep. RJ splashed the three. You know, that type of patience, just letting the game come to him, I think that's where Julius can truly help us. Yeah, and look, the Knicks need him because the Knicks do not have efficient scores. RJ, look, he's been great as a rookie, but he's not a great shooter. He's not an efficient player. For as great as Frank is, and we'll talk about him, not an efficient offensive player. Marcus Morris, even in the way the Knicks are using him, if he's not hitting an open three, all those mid-range shots, not an efficient offensive player. That's why they signed Julius Randle. They need him to be an efficient scorer if this team is going to compete over the next month when when the schedule gets a lot tougher. You got got to be an efficient scorer, man. Last night, twelve for seventeen. He was excellent. Three for five from three. You know, his three point numbers were are, are um, down from last year. Last year, he was at a career high at a hovering around forty percent. Uh, this year, not so much. So, as you said, he has to be that efficient scorer for us to have any chance of winning games. Yeah, no question. His true shooting percentage is down 10% from last year. His three-point percentage is down 10%. He's shooting, I think, two fewer free throws a game. So hopefully this is a little point in the right direction for him. What do you think about Mitch coming off the bench and Gibson starting at center? Right now, if it's not broke, don't fix it. <laughs> I agree. Uh, Mitch, is, Mitch, Mitch is my guy. He's the favorite, my favorite player on the team. Since he came back from that concussion, I mean, he, he's been playing – uh, like he has to catch up. I mean, the last two games against uh, Charlotte and, and Dallas, Charlotte, he had 17 points, 12 boards. The Dallas game, excellent game, 16 points, 8 rebounds. I mean, he's at the top of the league in per, top of the league in true shooting percentage, offensive rebounding percentage. The thing I love about Mitch is the games where, you know, his block numbers are, are a little bit down compared to last year, but if you're watching the games, he alters so many shots and changes so many decisions that the opposing team has to make, and those don't register on the stat sheet. So I love what Mitch is bringing for us off the bench. It's keeping him out of foul trouble. Conversely, Taj, I think, is playing right now, last stretch a few games. I would say since that, that game in Dallas to now, I think Taj is really playing like the guy that we thought we were getting. You know, he's always in the right spots. He's, he's leading, he's defending, he's rebounding, and he's also, you always see him um, teaching. He's always in RJ's ear, he's in Frank's ear, he's always trying to get the guys together, and I think Taz is providing that, that leadership that we badly need at times. Yeah, I love, I love to see him, and we've seen it a bunch of times, when the team makes a simple defensive mistake, a bad rotation, a stupid double team, he gets visibly upset. And I think yep. to have a veteran like that, which they really haven't had here, let's be honest, in a few years, to really show these guys how important it is to do those little things right on that end of the floor, it, I think it rubs off. I agree. Absolutely, man. And, and I just love what he's bringing to this team. His team, Morris, uh, I, I just love the, the toughness and the leadership that these guys are bringing. Hopefully it translates to W's, but obviously it's, it's been an up-and-down year uh, this early in the season. And, and they care. You know, you mentioned it with Randall. As, as frustrating as he's been this year and his defensive lapses and the turnovers, you could tell he cares. When he plays poorly, you see it on his face. He is devastated. Uh-huh. Marcus Morris cares. Taj Gibson cares. You see Neil Aquino, whenever he makes a defensive mistake, we saw it last night, he let uh, Sexton get around in one play. He kind of slaps his hands together. He cares. Barrett cares. And I think we're just seeing a level of, you know, just guys that love to play basketball and – they do care what's happening around them that I don't think we're going to see this team go into one of those tailspins we've seen from Nick teams in the past few years 
just because so many guys seem to have at least that personal pride, especially on defense, where they just don't want to play poorly and be embarrassed. Well, well, they're certainly going to be battle tested coming up, man. <laughs> we have eleven games coming up against former playoff teams. You have the Nets, you have the Spurs, you have Philly twice, Milwaukee Bucks, Denver. Celtics. This, this is good. Winter's coming, then Denver. You know, winter is coming early for this team <laughs> uh, in Portland as well. You know, against yep. Carmelo and, and Dame Lillard, and so we're going to see what the what what these guys are made of because this part of the schedule is certainly going to test their character uh, and David Fisdale as well. You know, it's funny. I want to talk about Frank Nielakina because if you look at his numbers, you know, there's really not that much improvement over the last couple of years. He's down to 36% from the field, just 32% from three. Now, his numbers are better since he started starting, so you could take that into consideration. And recently, he's been shooting a little bit better. However, you look at those overall numbers, they're poor. However, and I think this is what's frustrated me and a lot of other Nick fans and you, his numbers don't matter. I mean, you just look at the impact he has on the game. Simple things on offense, those pick-and-roll passes to Taj Gibson. Defensively, rotating correctly, always in the right spot. He's a switchable defender. He can guard one through four. The way he impacts winning and losing is is like a player I haven't seen on the Knicks in a long time where it isn't reflected in the numbers nearly at all. That's absolutely right. And, and when you talk about the numbers, you know, I, I had on my show going into this game, his home and road splits, he was shooting 8% from three before <laughs> game, 20% from the field. And you look at that, but you live with it. Because as you said, he's, he's a Swiss army knife out there. And he, along with Taj, they just set the, and Morris, they set the tone defensively for this team. And if you're going to come in with the lineup with Morris or Randall, who are going to dominate the ball as they do, you can live with, with Frank, you know, not putting up the offensive numbers. Obviously, you want him to be more efficient with the shots that he does take. But he does so many other things on the defensive end. Offensively, we saw a lot more pick and roll being executed last night. Him finding guys, getting guys in the right spots. Um, he made a beautiful, beautiful no look whip pass to Marcus Morris in transition. Yep, and that really is what propels this team. You know, when this team is gonna, this team is gonna struggle to score at times. We know that we, they don't have uh, the proper shooting in in this lineup to to be consistent, and so it's gonna have to start on the defensive end. And so, if we're gonna talk about starting on the defensive end, it has to be Frank. You know, getting the steals, getting the team easy points in transition, because that's the only way that we're gonna be able to stay in games. Yeah, you're 100% right, and I think we're starting to see Fisdale. I don't know why it took him so long, CP, but we're starting to see some better spacing on some of these screen rolls. We saw it last night with uh, Frank and Gibson. We're seeing it with the second unit a little bit with Dennis Smith Jr. and Mitchell Robinson, where if you just spread the floor a little bit, you can get Julius Randle rolling to the basket. You can get Gibson on a little pick and pop. You can get Mitch with the lobs. And I think early in the year they were running pick and rolls and those dribble handoffs, but the spacing was so bad they just didn't work. I feel like we're seeing more of that and a better execution of those plays in the last three or four games. Absolutely, and I think part of that is just the IQ of a guy like a Todd Gibson. Again, just always being um, in the right spot, knowing where to be. I also give credit to Fizz, kind of keeping Portis, you know, separate from that group, um, keeping him on that second unit. Obviously, with DSJ, we know that with DSJ, his dribble penetration is his strength. Obviously, the rest of his game needs to catch up. Uh, but as you said, the, the spacing has been much better, and 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 as a result, the pick and roll has been uh, executed a lot better over the past few games. How about Dennis Smith Jr.? I thought he started to figure things out against Dallas in the last two games. He wasn't quite as bad as he was the first you know, few games of the year. I thought his athleticism looked a lot better. But we still saw a couple bad turnovers, some foolish passes, you know, these weird, hesitating, mid-range jumpers when he can't get all the way to the basket. What's your overall take on, on Dennis Smith Jr., where he is and, and, and kind of where he's heading? Man, I was at the Dallas game, and to see him – um, really contributing that way and finding each of the alley oops and and just you know breaking down the defense. It was so refreshing to see a point guard just get into the tooth of the defense, get into the paint and, and create from there. And and it just looked like the old DSJ. Uh, the last two games he hasn't really been that guy. I mean the Hornets game he had five fouls in seven minutes. You know sometimes with DSJ it just seems like it's between the ears. And I think one thing he's 
he's overthinking the, the point guard position. I think he, he's trying too hard to facilitate. He's trying to uh, perfect his, his new jump shot. And I just think he's overthinking. And then on the other side, defensively, it's just the same lapses that you saw since he's coming as a rookie. He's got to have better defensive court awareness. He's always losing guys. He's losing guys on the rebound. He, you know, he, guys are slipping past him and, and hitting wide open three pointers. He's late on rotations. I, you know, I just think with DSJ, it's, it's just between the ears, man. He's got a lot that he's thinking about. And I think it's going to be interesting to see once Alfred Payton heals up. How, you know, how does that point guard rotation play out once again? I, I just don't know. Yeah, neither do I. And I do like what Fisdale's trying to do with that second unit. He's got Dotson, Knox, and Portis there to spread the floor. And as much as I love Mitch like you, and he's eventually going to be their starting center, having those three shooters out there with DSJ and Mitch to run screen and roll, I think it makes sense if they can just put it all together. It makes a lot of sense. And like, like I said with Mitch, I mean, as much as I would love him on the starting unit, I think Taj has given you uh, more than enough capable defense and that, you know, you bring Mitch off the second unit, run the screen and roll with, with uh, DSJ, uh, be enough of an impact that you can get that proper floor space and get it to Portis, get it to Knox, get it to Dotson. You have your knockdown shooters uh, out there on the wing. So I, I like what he's doing with that second unit as well. Kevin Knox, I thought he started the season pretty well. And slowly but surely, the shooting numbers have began to fall back to where they were last year. I don't think either of us doubt that he's going to be a good three-point shooter long-term. He's got a sweet stroke. He's got a good touch. But some of his drives to the basket, CP, are starting to revert to the things we saw last year where he's kind of running into guys, doesn't have great balance, and he's down to 39% from the field again. What's your overall take on what you've seen from Knox with the first uh, dozen games or so? First few games, of my two words for Kev were accuracy and efficiency. That was Kev, um, my, my two words to describe him, especially coming off the rookie campaign. Uh, the catch-and-shoot three-pointers, he was right on the money. Uh, a lot more aggressive out there. And then, you know, maybe like the last five games or so, he's kind of come back to life. I mean, he shot two for ten from the field last night. And the thing about Kev is, if his offense isn't on, you know he's not a good defender, and so he, he, he kind of becomes a minus out there uh, because, again, he's, he's another guy who has a lot of defensive lapses, um, doesn't you know have that lateral speed to keep up with guys sometimes late on rotation. So hopefully he, he can get back to, uh, to, to what he did in the first few games because he was certainly uh, a thrill to have off the bench as a catch-and-shoot three-point shooter. Yeah, one thing that I think hurts him, he's never going to be able to guard threes, right? The only position right. he's going to be able to guard are, are power forwards. I'm not sure if he's strong enough as a rebounder yet, but I just feel like as important as Randall and Morris are to the team, and you got to play him, and I'm not arguing they shouldn't, I do think their additions are, help, are hurting his short-term contributions yeah. because he, I he, agree. he, yeah, I mean, he, he just can't drive around threes. He's still, he made a nice pass last night uh, on, on a little drive and dish, but overall he's still a, a, not a willing passer and he's a poor passer. And just until he starts to get those minutes as a stretch four, I think we're going to see some of these struggles in terms of his over, overall all around game. He's such a poor passer that last night I saw him and Bobby Portis in a pick and roll and he made such a beautiful pass to Portis. <laughs> I almost jumped out of my chair because you never saw that from Kevin yep. Knox before. And I agree with you. I think the additions of Morris and Randall certainly set him back. And I think Portis set him back. And, and you know, we can always argue whether or not the, the, the late acquisition of Morris, if it had been any earlier, maybe we wouldn't have Portis here. But I think come February, I would like to try to trade Portis at the very least. I'd love to trade Morris, but at the very least, trade Portis, try to get another rim-protecting big, open up the backup for, for Kevin Knox, and, and maybe he can you know get his minutes there. Because you, another guy coming back is Reggie Bullock. You yeah. know, once Reggie Bullock comes in again, how does that shake up the rotation? He's another knockdown shooter that you're going to want to take a look at. And so, again, I think Kevin Knox could be impacted there as well if he doesn't uh, uh, in, you know, increase his shooting. In these next few games. You know, it's funny you mentioned the Morris thing, because before the year, I, w I was on board with you. I'm like, look, if you can get a, a nice deal and offer for him come February, that's great. I'm at the point now, though, if some team comes and offers two second-round picks for him, I almost think he's too important the way the team is built to move him. Now, if, if, if you're getting a late one, 
all right, cool, I'm on board, let's do it. But I think you kind of have to worry about the value you get from Moore simply because of the impact he has on the team. And, and you know, if they're hanging around the eighth seed, which I think is unlikely, but I'll throw the if out there. Yeah. You know, I think you have to make sure you get something good back for Morris and not just trade them for the sake of trading them. Agree. Totally agree. And and I'm with you. I'm looking late first round pick for him. Um, and because he's having a career year, I mean, three point shooting, he's having a career year in points, three point shooting rebounds. I mean, Marcus Morris is, is, uh, he's playing well, obviously with, with this team, with the lack of talent on this team, obviously his, his strengths are, are certainly, uh, are accentuated here, but he's playing well for us. He's leading us. He's, he's playing well on both ends defensively. I, I think, I, I don't think we, we praise him enough on the defensive end. And offensively, he, he's been lights out, man. We call him a bootleg mellow on, uh, <laughs> on, on this show because he has that, you know, three level offensive repertoire that he breaks out. So I would say, like you, like you, if we're hovering around eight, I would say keep him. If we can get a late first, you know, ship him out west or to one of these contending teams. You would have to look into it just because we're we're still in the asset acquisition phase. Yeah, you know, it's funny you mentioned Portland earlier. That could actually, I think, be a team that could use them. I mean, they they they're so desperate for wings that they just signed Carmelo Anthony. So I think right. that 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 could be a destination too. Let's talk about a guy, R.J. Barrett, and mm-hmm. we all knew he wasn't going to be that efficient as a scorer coming in. He wasn't efficient at Duke. He's not going to be efficient in the NBA. So the f- 41% from the field is not surprising, and it's okay. We've seen his free throw shooting begin to get better. It's inched above 50%, and I think that will normalize throughout the year. Here's why I'm excited about him. One, despite the two-and-a-half turnovers, which I think comes from driving into some crowds sometimes, he's been a really good passer. He's been a willing passer. His defense has been a lot better than it was at Duke. He's a legitimate Four positional switch defensive player. He's been that good. And he's shooting 37% from three. I think those are all really, really good signs for his future. I, I agree. And like you said, we, we knew he wasn't going to be an efficient shooter coming in. Uh, what I love about RJ is just his aggressiveness, his offensive awareness, the floor game, uh, his willingness to f- facilitate uh, the passes that he can make out there. And he, he's right up there in, in the rookie contention. I mean, right now he's third in points per game second in rebounds, and second in assists. You know, he's right there. Obviously, John Morant is the, is the cream of the crop right now, but R- RJ's right there. And what I loved about him, two things these past two games, he's been four for five from the free throw line. Yeah. I mean, he's shooting 40-something percent from the free throw line, which is abysmal. And obviously, that was the same way coming in through college. But the thing about RJ overall is just he's going to work. He's going to work on his weaknesses, man. The character of this kid, is what I love the most because you know the talent is there. You know he can really be a great player, but he has uh, the mental fortitude, the background to really put it all together. And and we 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 got a we hit we hit it right on this draft pick, no doubt about it. We and, definitely hit it right. And the shooting is going to be the swing skill. If he becomes a better shooter, uh-huh. he can become a really good player. And I was worried, legitimately, and we talked about it over the summer when I was on your show. I was worried about his kind of bully ball shoot over and through people stuff that he did in college and then not working right. in the NBA. Well, guess what? It works in the NBA. I, I can't believe it yeah. sometimes, but he's, I mean, for a 19 year old kid, it's really impressive. He's getting to the basket with ease, man. The, the aggressiveness that he's showing out there, he's getting there with ease. We saw him, we saw him using the right hand a lot. Yeah. You know, he's getting a little bit ambidextrous with his finishes as well. And like I said, the, the sky's the limit for him. And the defense, as you said, the defense uh, with, with RJ and Frank out there. Now, the speed kills us. You know, as, as we've seen, the speed has killed us. Um, but I thought they did a great job, especially last night, um, adjusting in terms, of, uh, in terms of trapping the point guards. You know, Sexton went off on us for about 30 points in that first blowout against the Cavs. Uh, last night we held them to 14, and I thought a lot of that was we did a great job of trapping the guards early yeah. and just letting the rest of the guys on Cleveland beat us. And so, uh, R.J. Frank, you have to give credit to those guys as well on the perimeter. And by the way, five and a half free throws a game for a rookie in R.J. Barrett. And once he gets that percentage up, and he has creeped above 50%, we're getting there. Yep. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's great. I mean, it, it, it really is good. I, I want to get your take before I ask you to give me a little preview of the next month of basketball, which could be really ugly at times for the Knicks because of the opponents. 
Uh, your take on the whole thing last week with Mills and Perry and the hostage video press conference and Fisdale yeah. through 10 games. I, I'll tell you my opinion on it, but I want to get yours first. Well, it was something that I've never seen before. Um, this early in the season, this press conference, happening and and basically putting David Fisdale on notice and you know it was something it was such an embarrassing loss um to this Cleveland team you had lost to Sacramento uh, a few nights before that by a wide margin as well I just think you know there there are expectations here and and whether they're realistic or not the fans are going to have expectations Dolan's going to have expectations and and what Mills and Perry said in the press conference was wrong. They want to see consistency and they want to see the team improving. And I think those are those are the two things that the fans want to see. A lot of us had realistic expectations around um, where this team was going to hover around in terms of wins. You know, it was well, you know, five games above or below thirty, which I think was realistic given this given this roster. Sure. So it's, it's not necessarily about you know winning a ton of games. It's about the quality of your losses, if that makes sense. You know, you, you especially at home, you, you can't have this Cleveland team, mm-hmm. the Sacramento team, the, these teams that are in the lottery with you uh, just just bulldoze you in your, in your own building by 20 or so points. So, I, you know, the press conference, it was, it was typical MSG. I didn't really like it, but obviously it was driven from Dolan. You, you knew where that was coming from. And as the owner of the team, hey, listen, you, if you look at it from a business standpoint, you went out, you spent all this money on free agency. Obviously, you didn't get your, your prize targets. You want to see some competitive basketball on the court. And so, obviously, Dolan called in Mills and Perry at halftime, chewed them out, and everything cascaded from there. Yeah, so he, he and I, I'm with you on almost everything you said. And yeah. the way I look at it, CP, is I think this is Mills – who had tried to sell the fan base that, oh, this is all part of the plan. We got the guys that we wanted. He told the, he told the same exact thing to James Dolan. So yes. when the team then comes out, and like you said, Dolan spent all this money, and his team president told him, we're going to compete for an eight seed. We're going to be in the mid-30s. You know, We're going to be right there most of the season. And you don't look like a real basketball team in the first 10 games. That's right. bad. If I'm Dolan, I'm upset. I get it. And I get where Mills and Perry are coming from, that they don't think Fisdale was maximizing the talent on the roster and the team wasn't playing up to their talent. I think that's fair, too. And in the long run, is Fisdale the answer at head coach? I don't know that. If I had to guess right now, I'd say no. But do I know that? I yeah. don't. Uh, do I think long term Steve Mills is the answer uh, for the GM or president that's going to bring this team to the promised land? Hell no. I don't think any of us think that. He's yeah. Steve Mills. <laughs> no. But all that said, you want this team to be normal for once. And what normal teams don't do is send out their front office before the head coach after a bad yeah. loss to talk to the media. And what NBA players who might have a chance to come to the Knicks as a free agent in 2020 or more likely 2021, what they don't want to see is that. So that's how I look at it. I, I agree. And, and you know, uh, amongst the fan base, you know, we get so angry when you have certain outlets come out and sometimes, yeah, sometimes they're hit pieces or, or unfair criticism of the team, but it's another thing to bring it on yourself. And this press conference, certainly brought that and you had for almost the whole week uh opinion pieces and players coming out and other coaches coming out and and it was just un- again unnecessary attention brought on to this team who's already struggling and trying to come together it was certainly a cya moment for steve mills yep. because as you said he sold the fan base he sold dolan that this was a good plan going forth and you know they came out the gate looking terrible i think i think Fizz is is the, he can feel the pressure. You know, I interviewed uh, Mark Berman of the Post uh, during the, the opening night game against San Antonio, and, and he said, you know, he notices a, a difference in Fizz between last year and this year. He's a lot more curt uh, with the media. A lot, so you, you can even hear it in the post game. Oh yeah, for sure. He asks his questions. I mean, Fizz is very sharp, and, and you know, he just doesn't have patience for it anymore. So you can see it, it's it's wearing on him. So. You just got to hope for the best going going into this next stretch of games. Hopefully, they can shock some people. 
And and maybe this is maybe this is the stretch that galvanizes his team. You never know. You gotta yeah. hope for the best. Yeah, I'm with you, and I do think and you, you used the phrase earlier, which is a weird phrase, and you never like to be okay with losses, but I do think the quality of the losses that they're going to incur over the next month, and they are going to have a lot of losses. It's a really tough schedule. You mentioned the Sixers twice, Celtics, Nets, West Coast trip, Nuggets twice, Blazers. You know, go down the list. It's, it's going to be hard, but if they can just hang with these teams and play them close to the final three minutes of the game, and then you know what? If Damian Lillard comes out and hits a game-winning three, it happens. If Kyrie Irving gets another so crazy it. step back, whatever, you get it. It happens, but you, you have to at least show that you're a competent NBA team over this stretch. Agreed. And and to me, it's going to start again on the defensive end. I think defense has, has been improved since last year. The three-point defense obviously leaves a lot to be desired still. They have a lot of work to do. We saw last night against the Cavs. Uh, that's what kept the Cavs in the game uh, was it was their three-point shooting, uh, despite the fact that the Knicks scored 34 points off of the, off the Cavs' turnovers. So and, and we know that the Hornets game, you know, we gave Devontae Grant nine three-pointers. 17 of 48, the Hornets shot from three. So I think it, it's got to start from there. I think we're starting to build a bit of an identity on the defensive end. And I think if we can start it from there, we'll, we'll, we'll be in a lot of these games. Yeah, I'm with you. And one thing I like about the defense is that Fisdale is starting to play defensive-oriented players more, which he didn't do last year. Gibson, Neil Aquina, Dotson. It helps everything having those guys on the floor more. One thing I don't like, CP, do you still know how they want to guard the pick and roll? Are they trapping? Are they switching everything? Are they zoning it up? I still feel like he, for a young team and a team that's kind of been thrown together, that's trying to figure things out, I would like Fisdale to maybe simplify what they're doing on screen and roll defense so they're not switching it up every game so maybe these guys could get into a little bit of a groove in terms of what they're doing every single possession. And I think the last three or four games, you've seen a little bit of everything. Yeah. <laughs> you've seen the zone. You saw last night, you saw trapping straight out of the gate. Previous games, they were switching on, on more pick and roll. So it, it's, it's the hardest play to cover in the game, and they've, they've got to figure it out. You know, obviously, you, you have Frank out there, you have Taj, you have Marcus Marsh, you know, you have some capable defenders out there. As you said, they need to figure it out what their philosophy, what their approach is going to be, because obviously that's going to help in terms of them building chemistry, their rotations, their communication with each other. So it's going to be key if they get those, uh, you know, the proper defensive uh, schemes out there. Now here's the good news. We don't have to talk about Kristaps Porzingis for the rest of the year because they played the Mavericks twice. The better news is that they beat the Mavericks twice. So w- what's your final word here and thoughts on the Porzingis trade? Mine are simple. The value of this trade is going to be determined by how good Porzingis is. We know the return is not going to be great. That, I think, is kind of—it might be okay, but it's not going to be great. We know that already. But we don't know if Porzingis is going to be worth that max contract. Is he ever going to be able to be the second-best player on a championship team? Or is he only going to be able to be the third-best player on a championship team that, by the way, is always consistently hurt and fades in the second half of the year? So, to me, that's going to be the determining factor— Here's CP on what poor Zingas is, and that's going to determine how people look back at that deal. I agree 100%. Um, this trade is forever going to be linked to his performance. As fans, we're always going to be looking out of our periphery to see how he did, <laughs> to see if he, if he takes that, you know, takes it to a superstar level. Listen, I, I, the Porzingis trade was an unfortunate chapter in our history. Obviously, this is a player that we could have used here. I mean, imagine a Porzingis in the lineup with an RJ, with a Frank, and, and so on. And Mitch. Clearly, oh. and Mitch, and Mitch. Come on, the Twin Towers. Oh, man. Like none other. I mean, that, that would have been a perfect combination. I think, sadly, we'll, pro- we'll never know what the truth was. We, we heard the Knicks side of it. We haven't really heard Porzingis' side of it. When he reacted to the booze uh, to last week's game, you know, he kind of leaked out, well, the fans only know what they know. Willie Hernan Gomez said the same thing in an interview with Mark Berman. Yep. The fans only know what they know. So we'll, we'll never know the truth. And as you said, this trade, the success of this trade is going to be more so tied to his performance, his durability, the, the win and loss record of the Mavs compared to, obviously, Dennis Smith Jr. We don't know what our draft picks are going to turn out to be. 
hopefully they turn out well, or hopefully we take that cap space that we gained and, and turn it into some good over the next, you know, three or four years. But I'm, I'm glad we got the win. Obviously, um, a, a Thursday night game in at MSG. I mean, we blew the roof off of the arena. Oh, it was great. It was I was like there, too. It was game. awesome. Oh, man, it was great. It, it was incredible, man. I interviewed so many fans after the game, and, and the jubilation was just – we were 3-9 at that point. So <laughs> <laughs> the, the jubilation was ridiculous. But that's just the passion of the fan base, man, and, and that's why we do what we do because uh, we just want to see this team do well. We just want to see this team succeed. And, and win the big games. And by the way, and I'm not going to say something silly like Fisdale said a couple days ago that the Knicks are like, you know, two games out of the eight seed because nobody cares. Oh, God. But yeah, that bad look. But I will say this yeah. right now, there are nine teams in the East with six or fewer wins. Nine, including the Nets with five, by the way. And the Knicks now have four. What are your final thoughts here? on the team, things you're keeping an eye on, things that interest you that maybe we didn't cover as they head through this difficult stretch in the coming weeks? Uh, well, again, it's just going to be the return of these two guys. It's going to be Peyton and Bullock. How do we get them into this rotation that seems to be set right now, but we could also use. We can use Reggie Bullock as a knockdown three-point shooter. Uh, we could, you, you know, you could argue that Peyton has been the best facilitator on this team before he went out. Yeah. How do you get him in, and how does that affect Dennis Smith Jr. going forward? You know, as you said, I have I don't really pay attention to the standings this early because it's just, as you said, you have so many teams that are hovering around that spot. There's really no separation. Yep. But to me, it's how do we look coming out of this 11-game stretch? How do we look after we get through the first West Coast trip? The West Coast trip, to me, is always the equalizer for this team. Um, in, in terms of what direction they're going to go go through, and and just how does this team just maintain that chemistry going through? There's, there's going to be a lot of adversity coming coming up, and I just want to see how they respond to it. By the way, you want to know how bad the Eastern Conference is? If you take the Knicks out of the mix, the bottom one, two, three, four, five, six, seven teams in Eastern Conference have lost a combined seventeen consecutive games. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> it is ugly, man. Kawhi Leonard goes out west. The, the East is is a barren wasteland right now, man. Jeez. Except, for, except for the Celtics, which I'm sure makes Nick fans a lot of happy. They just keep winning games. Doesn't matter who's on their damn roster. Uh, doesn't matter who's on the team. I mean, Kemba is is leading this team. They look like world beaters. I thought they would have taken a step back, but uh, give credit. Gordon Hayward is at, absolutely having a bounce back year. And they look great. Marcus Smart obviously leading on the defensive end. You have Tatum there. Celtics look tough, man. Yeah, and it'll they be definitely the, look like a tough out. Yeah, and it'll be the 76ers on Wednesday for the Knicks. The Knicks get their first big test in a while against probably the best defensive team in the East, if not the NBA. Uh, a lot of length, a lot of size. It'll be fun to watch. CP, this was a lot of fun. Let's do it again soon. I'm happy to come on with you guys again whenever you want to do it. And uh, why don't you tell the folks one more time where they can find your work? Absolutely, John, and it's youtube.com slash KnicksFanTV. Also on Twitter slash KnicksFanTV. We, we talk about the games on Twitter and after the game on YouTube. Take live calls and, and special guests such as John Schmilk as well. So, John, I appreciate you having me on. Love what you do with the Knicks. Really love what you do with the Giants. Uh, you, you keep me covered on, on both of those uh, uh, up, and, <laughs> up and down seasons. With the Giants more down than up. But uh, I appreciate everything you do, man. I love your work. I appreciate that, man. And, and up and down was a very kind way to put it. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, to say the least. <laughs> Thanks, dude. I appreciate it, CP. Be good, man. Thanks a lot, John. Take care. Later. <laughs> 